What's up, guys? Welcome back to class. Okay, we had started the JFK presidency lecture series. I had already released part one uh, in the intro part, and then I did a separate lecture about the, the election of 1960. We've kind of covered Kennedy's background, who he was as a person, his family life, um, all that good background information on him, how he's kind of a new style of politician that's very camera friendly. Uh, and then the epically close election of 1960 that he ends up coming up out on top over Richard Nixon. Uh, in part two today I, and over the next few parts, I'm going to cover big events that happened during the Kennedy presidency. Now, he was only president for three years and then he gets assassinated as he's starting to campaign for a second term. Uh, however, in the three years that Kennedy was president, man, a lot of huge stuff happens in the Cold War, like kind of in the foreign policy realm and in domestic policy. So today we're going to look at the first big foreign policy issue that he would confront that would totally tie into the Cold War era. So uh, this little chunk of notes, this little snippet, you definitely should add on to your Cold War era notes page. OK, uh, and I'll give you a heading to put in in just a minute. You don't have to put in JFK presidency. Hopefully you've already taken some, some notes on that. Um, I, I'll get into the more specifics of what you need to know and write down uh, in just a minute. Now, first thing that like obviously something we've been talking about <clears throat> America is confronting the communist world and we have that policy of containment. We don't want uh, communism to, to spread any further than, than it, it's already gone. Um, to understand the first big event that Kennedy has to confront, this first big kind of debacle that hits in his presidency, you have to understand the Cuban-American relationship uh, in this head. This is something I was unaware of when I became a U.S. history teacher. Uh, but the, America has had its sights set on Cuba for a very long time, like going back 100 years before Kennedy, back almost to the era of Lincoln. Now, this slide, I'm just going to give you kind of a quick history of the Cuban-American relationship uh, in a nutshell. You don't really have to write any of this down. Actually, some of this stuff we had already covered back in quarter one. Uh, so I'll try to be really brief with this. And then the next slide I have, that's the stuff that you would want to write down that would tie into uh, this this quarter exam and the quiz that we would have coming up later this week. So quick rundown uh, of what happened. Like Cuba had been part of the Spanish empire, remember, for a long time. So going back to like the 1600s or something, uh, Cuba, in case you are not sure where that place is, uh, like here is the tip of Florida. So this is America. Cuba is this big island down here in the Caribbean that's about 90 miles south of Florida. Uh, so set strategically important location, kind of one of the biggest islands of the Caribbean. Uh, now, Spain had controlled Cuba for a long time. Back in quarter one, we had talked about the Spanish-American War, where, uh, and I don't want to rehash all that, but that was the war that, like, before Teddy Roosevelt was president, he ends up resigning as Secretary of the Navy and goes and puts together the Rough Riders and charges up San, San Juan Hill. Uh, it was described as a splendid little war because it only lasted about a year. America won all of the battles uh, and the Spanish Empire comes crashing down and officially ends with that war. Uh, now, you may remember... America picked up a bunch of colonies then. Uh, we didn't call them colonies, but they're just uh, commonwealths that were adding on to America, U.S. territories, okay? Uh, Spain only had had four territories left in their empire, the Philippines and Guam out in the Pacific Ocean, and then Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean here by, by the Atlantic Ocean. Um, now, the one we wanted the most by far of those four territories was Cuba. And that's the only one that we don't get. So America, after that war that we had covered way back in quarter one, it happened 60 years before this time, uh, America picks up the Philippines and Guam out in the Pacific, Puerto Rico, and Guam and Puerto Rico are still U.S. territories to this day. Uh, and then Cuba, because everybody kind of wanted Cuba because it's a big island. It's very strategically important. It would be an important military base of operations. Um, kind of the American uh, perspective on this was that essentially – we didn't see Spain as a big threat to us. So when Spain controlled it for a long time, we weren't willing to go to war with Spain over it until we were ready to go to war with Spain over it. Uh, but they weren't seen as a big threat. Now, uh, this is what I'd want you to get from why uh, Cuba is strategically important. We felt like because it's so close to America and you could base up a big military there like an invasion force, it would have been totally unacceptable to have 
the island of Cuba fall into one of our rivals' hands. So we did not want, even though the British were normally friendly with them, we didn't want it getting added to the British Empire. For God's sakes, we definitely wouldn't want like the, the Germans or the Japanese uh, or, or the Russians to come in there and take that island. So that was a no-go. Like if another country tried to come in and take Cuba, America was ready to go to war. And this was goes back to the 1800s. That was absolute no-go. We weren't all going to allow that to happen. Uh, the best scenario that U.S. foreign policy experts foresaw, and we'd been planning to try to do this for a while, was add Cuba on to the United States. Now, some people would have wanted to just make it a territory or kind of like a colony. Other people had talked about making it an actual state, making it part of the union. Uh, that was kind of the best case scenario, that it, it would be added on as a U.S. territory. We'd have military and naval bases there. Uh, and then option three is what actually happens, where essentially the European powers at the end of the Spanish-American War didn't want it like the British and French who are kind of arbitrating that treaty uh, did not want America to get Cuba. We didn't want them to have Cuba. Uh, so kind of by default, Cuba just becomes an independent nation, which America felt like, okay, we can live with that. Uh, we also do get Guantanamo Bay. So we do get one tiny naval base on the island of Cuba. But by and large, it just becomes an independent nation. Uh, from the American perspective, it's like, okay, this is in our backyard. We can keep an eye on them. We'll work with the Cuban government. They won't be a threat to us. And we'll just make sure that no outside powers come in and add Cuba into their empire. Uh, so we keep very close tabs on the island. For about 50 years, it's just an independent country that has elections, uh, kind of a republic-style government similar-ish to the United States. In 1952, kind of early into the Cold War, there is a coup there. Uh, this guy, Batista, who is a general, uh, basically seizes control of the island. Now, he's not a communist. He's not a fascist. He's just a military guy that takes control. Uh, and basically, there's a lot of unrest on the island because the government wasn't functioning very good. The people were, had low standards of living and were upset. So this guy seizes control of the island. And it lasts for about seven years where the Batista government, he is a dictator in charge, and he is willing to kind of work with the United States. We don't view him as a threat. So we can live with that. Um, but then uh, think about the early Cold War, the events we've covered, everything kind of leading up to like Cuba going communist in 1959. We've had going back about 10 years, the Berlin airlift where the Soviets try to steal our chunk of, uh, of the city of Berlin. Then China goes communist. Then the Korean War is fought. Then uh, through the mid-1950s, Joe McCarthy uh, basically has communist witch hunts going on on people's televisions and whatnot, where people are getting blacklisted and accused of being communist. Uh, the paranoia about communism is super duper high. Uh, now, Eisenhower was president from like 52, actually like 53 to 61 was when his term uh, had lasted. He was seen as very tough on communism, but one of the big kind of debacles that happens at the end of his presidency is there is another revolution. This guy Batista was kind of corrupt and the people were not super happy with him. Uh, and it leads to this guy over here with the beard, Fidel Castro, leading a communist revolution in Cuba. Uh, that is seen as, man, that that's bad, bad news. Uh, because remember, the American policy of containment was we stop communism where it's at and we're not going to let it spread. Up to this point in the Cold War, when we're thinking about like confronting communism, it's generally an ocean away. We're talking about events that are happening over in Europe, like in Berlin, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, or we're talking about like China uh, going communist or the Korean War. That's all the way across the Pacific Ocean. This one hits really, really close to home. Uh, Cuba is right in our backyard. And now the communists, this is the kind of the first communist takeover in the Western Hemisphere, which is like our turf. Uh, so that's very disconcerting. For any other president, it would have probably been totally disastrous for this to happen on their watch. But remember, Eisenhower was seeing his strong suit was he had a military background. People trusted him to be tough on communism. Now, he could have intervened in this revolution and gone in and tried to stop Fidel Castro from taking over. Uh, you know, he had the military background to do it. America definitely had a powerful enough military to go and intervene. He decides not to do it because he doesn't want to be seen as like interfering 
appearing in another country's like internal domestic struggles. Uh, for one, that's kind of the idealistic reason. But I think the real reason Eisenhower doesn't go and intervene is he's worried it will provoke another a reaction from the Soviets. He's worried that if we go in and kind of take control and, and seize Cuba uh, and kick this Castro guy out, at, well, what's what are the Russians going to do? Are they going to go and try to seize West Germany or West Berlin or something like that? Uh, are the Chinese or the Soviets, are they going to start a new war in Korea? Uh, so he's worried about that re reaction. And it's right at the end of his second term as president. He's not running again. Uh, so he kind of just shelves this problem and it's going to get passed on to whoever wins the next election, the election of, of 1960. Uh, now, going into it, I hit this in the, the election of 1960 notes, but Kennedy is very well liked by the American people. He's seen as a progressive guy with new ideas. Uh, they trust him on a lot of like domestic policy, like internal issues. But his Achilles heel, the weak point for Kennedy was a lot of people questioned whether he was going to be tough enough to stand up to communism. So going into his presidency, that's already his kind of weak point is people are not sure if this young, new, charismatic politician uh, is going to be tough enough to stand up to the Soviets uh, in communist takeovers around the world. Now, this is the stuff that I want you to have into your notes today. Kind of have that background dynamic between Cuba and the United States. Uh, the first kind of big event that we're going to cover from the Kennedy presidency is the Bay of Pigs Massacre, kind of an ominous sounding title. Uh, anyway, it basically is a failed invasion of Cuba, all right, to try to get that communist guy out of there, but it does not work. So make sure you put in a heading in your Cold War notes called the Bay of Pigs Massacre. I just all definitely get hit on quizzes and probably have a, a question or two on the exam about it. So when Kennedy becomes president, think about it. World affairs don't stop happening when America has an election. Uh, but American presidents change and the situation in the world just kind of keeps on plugging away. So Kennedy wins the election, becomes president. He sits down initially right when he gets sworn into office and he's getting briefed on the military situation around the world, how the Cold War is going. Uh, they're probably throwing all kinds of information at him, talking about Korea and Japan and what's happening in Germany. Uh, well, one of the things that the Eisenhower administration had been planning was essentially a a takeover, uh, an attack on the Cuban uh, communist government where we were going to try to get a more friendly regime installed there. Uh, now, a lot of the people in Cuba were not happy about the country going communist. It was very divided. It was a controversial thing that happens. But by this point, by the time Kennedy's president, Castro has secured power. He is firmly in control of the island. He's established his government. He has a military. Uh, even though a lot of the Cuban people hate him and want him out of there, they hate the communists. But many of the people that were his enemies actually had fled Cuba when he took over and they came up to Florida. They, they came to the United States and they begged the American government to help and to intervene. They're like, man, this bad guy's taking control of our country. Get, back us up and w help us go down there and fight him and get him out of there. Uh, it seems like kind of a good plan. There's a lot of Cuban refugees are willing to go down there and fight this guy. They just don't have a military in the equipment that they would need to go fight an actual legitimate army, a, a different re regime that's in power. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so Castro, overall, kind of a, a bad dude, typical like communist dictator, pretty ruthless, executes a lot of his enemies, uh, all around kind of bad guy, like a, a much smaller scale version of a Joseph Stalin or something like that. Uh, anyway, these Cuban refugees beg us to give them air support. So the, the they had been... American CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency under Eisenhower, had been planning a top secret mission where essentially we were going to go land these Cuban refugees and equip them with guns and equipment and explosives. They're going to go and actually invade on the island and they're going to go, we're going to take them all the way around to the southern part of the island, not the Florida side, uh, drop them off. And then the American Air Force was going to come in and we were going to call in airstrikes that would take out a lot of the the Cuban military installations, take out their machine guns and tanks and their air force and things like that. Uh, for this mission to work successfully, it was heavily reliant on the American Air Force air power coming in and overwhelming the Cuban Cuban military uh, so that the refugees would have a chance at success on the ground. All right. 
Kennedy looks at the situation. Now, he had nothing to do with Cuba going communist. He had nothing to do with this whole covert mission that was getting planned. He just inherited it. Uh, it all got passed on to him from the previous administration. Also remember, Kennedy, his one, and he knows this, his one big weakness, uh, politically speaking, is that in the optics of politics of the time, a lot of people feel like, ah, is this young guy, is he going to be tough on communism? Does he have the backbone, what it takes to stand up to these tough communist dictators and and stuff? So he realizes this is kind of a weak spot for him. Uh, now, Kennedy looks at the whole situation. He's basically worried that, and this is a key part, you put this in, in your own words in your notes, that if he follows through on this, if he approves that the U.S. Air Force is going to go in and support this invasion, that the Soviets are going to react. He is convinced of that. He doesn't know exactly what they'll do, but he is sure that the Soviets will do something in Berlin, in Germany, or in Europe, that they'll do something out in Asia, and it's going to provoke a much bigger war. He does not want a World War III between the United States and Soviet Union to break out, and he's worried that America getting involved, overthrowing a communist regime in Cuba would be just that type of thing that could provoke and like be the spark that ignites a much bigger war. So Kennedy pulls the plug on this. Uh, this really pisses off a lot of people in the Central Intelligence Agency and in the American military. OK, emphasize that, that that was like an unpopular thing that Kennedy was doing. Eisenhower, the old general, the old man from the previous decade, was planning to go ahead with this. Uh, and now all these military guys are like, man, Kennedy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's young. He's weak. The old man, Eisenhower, was ready to go on this. And now this new guy gets elected and he's pulling the plug on these things that he doesn't even understand. Anyway, Kennedy, just to sum it up, made a lot of enemies there uh, when he does this, when he pulls the plug on this uh, in our CIA and in the military. That's going to come into play later on when we get to the Kennedy assassination, because there's a lot of conspiracy theories that think that the CIA was actually behind his his assassination. But more to come on that down the road. Uh, anyway, it, we're not happy about him, him saying no go on this. Uh, the Cuban refugees say, well, hell with you guys. We've been planning this for a couple of years now. We're going ahead with it. We're going to go invade and try to take our country back if we have American air support or not. So uh, basically, we... We, we allow them to do that, and we do give these guys some supplies and kind of hook them up. Well, they go down and invade in this little area that gets known as the Bay of Pigs. That's where it goes down. Uh, it wasn't called the Bay of Pigs at the time. But essentially, w when these guys go in and invade and land on the beaches, but they don't have any American air support, they get massacred. They get slaughtered, and it becomes like a Bay of Pigs getting slaughtered out there because Castro's Air Force, artillery, and machine guns just cut these guys to pieces. So they basically all get massacred or they get thrown into prison camps, POW camps there. It's a huge debacle. Uh, it, it does not go off as planned. I mean, we were still hoping that these guys would have success and go get rid of Castro because he's definitely an enemy of America. Um, but it didn't play out that way. So this is a huge debacle for JFK. And, it, and he, communism was already kind of his weak spot. This makes him even look worse. It gives him a huge black eye right when he comes into office, where it's like, man, the world really starts to have second thoughts in America if he has what it takes to stand up to the communists. Uh, the, you know, these guys, these refugees that were allies, they all get massacred. Cuba is still communist. Doesn't look good for Kennedy. Uh, and a lot of people blame him for it. And they say hindsight, looking back on it, he should have given them air support. He shouldn't have sent those guys in there. Uh, he knew that this was all going to go bad. He either should have pulled on it totally and not let it happen at all, or he should have followed through and, and had America go support this. Uh, now, th this kind of gets into the what if game, because if Kennedy had done that, who knows how history would be different? Cuba probably would have come back over to our side. We probably would have overthrown Castro, but it probably also would have unleashed another chain of events around the world where who knows what else would have happened. But but other wars may have likely broken out uh, because of U.S. interfering there. So anyway, it does not work. Cuba stays communist. Uh, that would be a key thing you could put in at the end, too, that the whole invasion fails, makes Kennedy look weak on communism, and... Uh, 
and Cuba stays communist and Castro stays in power. Okay, that's all I got for you on this. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with part three.